how we are going to do is, yeah. Uh, well, good morning to everybody. And this opportunity is a great opportunity. We are going to introduce uh, Professor Joan Raul from uh, the, uh, the School of, uh, the Dean of the School of Business at Mega Eva College, the City University of New York. She goes, she's got a uh, huge experience, uh, a formidable curriculum vitae, and therefore to, to go item by items, uh, as far as uh, her curriculum, it will be a long task and very hard to achieve. And therefore I would like to ask her, because I think she is the best person to describe herself, uh, a very simple question. Uh, could you please uh, give us a brief, a brief introduction about your current activities and what you have done in your past and what you are doing at the moment and what you are planning to do? <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you, my friend. Uh, I am currently the Dean of the School of Business at Megger Elvis College, City University of New York. I have a long uh, a history in the academy, but prior to the academy, I was in both government and corporate service. I started my career at the World Bank as a research assistant many, many years ago. And then I traveled to Tanzania and I worked on a Tanzania housing bank project. When I came back to the US, I went to work for the federal government and uh, to complete my uh, doctorate degree and my research in economics. I have my research primarily, primarily is in urban economics, uh, data analysis, and human resources. Upon finishing the degree in economics at Howard University in Washington, D.C., I was one of three African Americans uh, uh, to go into a special, no, before that, a special program with data resources. Data resources was founded by Otto Eckstein, the famous economist in Boston. Uh, as soon as I graduated, I went to work for IBM. I was uh, uh, at IBM for many years doing several different uh, uh, forecasting related jobs and marketing related jobs. I was also on the marketing team at the Federal Reserve Board of Governors. And later they assigned me to be the IBM visiting professor to Hampton University, that's in Virginia. That assignment changed my life. Uh, after a year as a visiting professor in economics, I, um, I, I left IBM. I did a year at Harvard University as an administrative fellow because I didn't really know at that point in time whether I wanted to be uh, on the faculty or if I wanted to be an academic administrator. My time at Harvard taught me that my skill set uh, would be better suited uh, as an academic administrator. I went back at Hampton as the chair of the economics, entrepreneurship, and um, information technology uh, division. And that time there were very few entrepreneurship programs. We launched one of, uh, uh, in general, and we want, launched one of the first entrepreneurship degree programs at a historically black college. I was the director of the center there, and that's where I grew to uh, uh, my understanding of the importance of entrepreneurship in underserved uh, economies, as well as the importance of economics in underserved economies. Uh, I, I have, I went through many assignments after Hampton University, uh, but what I understood most was that as an academic administrator, you serve the students, you serve the faculty, you serve the community. So uh, it has been a very rewarding experience. Uh, lovely, huh? And uh, what makes you most happy about all you have done so far? <laughs> <laughs> what I've come to learn is that there is joy in helping others. Uh, in my personal background, I am the first uh, in my entire family to earn a college degree. My great grandmother could not read or write. Um, we came from the Caribbean islands. And so what I understood is that education changes lives. Uh, I went to the University of Miami in Miami, Florida. 
uh, at a time where my father told me he wasn't allowed to sit in the Burger King across the street. I grew up in segregation. Um, I went to great segregated schools until I was in high school. So what, what, what makes me happy is the joy of understanding and knowing that persistence with hard work can pay off. Uh, as we go in our talk of a little further, I will tell you some of the challenges and disappointments that the young people have with education as it is today and the outcomes that it yields. But what the happiest day that I have, even happier than Christmas, is graduation day. When you see the parents and the students have their dreams come true. Many of them, at least in my institution, have worked not four, but six, eight years to get their first degree. And they, you can see it in their eyes and in their family eyes that the education has made a difference. So what makes me happy is not education in and of itself. It's the hopes and the dreams to people in the underserved communities that their lives can change and they can be lifted out of poverty. They could be lifted out of despair. Um, and there's a process. Not enough are lifted. Let me be very clear on that. But um, that's what makes me happy. My happiest day is graduation day. And lovely, huh? Could you please um, elaborate a bit more on that? And uh, I have a question here, and it says, uh, which is the main area of activities uh, where you feel you can make a more significant contribution to society? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Again, <laughs> Professor <laughs> Oh, uh, you know, I am passionate about the work. I, and the work is not an institution. The work is the work and the mission of helping others uh, contribute to society. You know, I, I have uh, had a great career. And as I am uh, going towards the twilight, I'm not saying end because I love what I do and I don't see the end. But I see that the power is in leveraging teams. The power is in working with others with different perspectives from different cultures, with different backgrounds. And the combination of all of that energy and effort together is greater than the yield of any one individual or any one institution. So I see my role as as a collector of thought leaders, helping to look at the problems that we don't talk about. What are the problems that we don't talk about? We don't talk about the global disparity in income and wealth around the world. You pick a country, any country, and there is significant income and wealth disparities. And um, I believe, and that's one of the reasons I go back to my entrepreneurship training. If you look at the top three richest men in the world, they were not the top three richest men in the world 20 years ago. In fact, they wasn't even on the list. But the top three are innovators. They are entrepreneurs. They are team builders. They, they see a need and they come to fix it. And they're not necessarily the first to market, but they see insight on how to leverage all of this wonderful talent that is around them. So I see my role as not necessarily Really, uh, uh, we'll get to be the top three, but I see our role, and I say our because it's a collective, of lifting those from the bottom up to create job creators, not job takers. And as they create jobs, not everybody can be a job creator, but certainly those who can, they can help make jobs for others, their peers, their families, their communities to lift them up. And uh, we've been working on that all with papers, uh, at conferences, uh, and, and, and executing. There, there, there are a lot of examples of where the synergy of many coming together, both in the academy, and let me just say, this is not an academic work alone, is the, ac the academy, the industry, the government, you know, and other organizations working together to do the lift up. And so I see my role as part of that effort. In fact, next week, I'm, I am one uh, and a member of uh, two panels for the United Nations Development Program. And this is the second 
year summit where uh, government officials and UN officials and ac uh, the academics come together and look at some of the problems. And this one is specifically in Africa, but uh, in, 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 by the weekend, I will also be doing uh, work and presentations in India. So I don't look at just one USA. I look at the globe and what can we do together. And the, because of the technology, I, last year I must have done at least four or five trips, Bangladesh, India, uh, London, uh, uh, Poland. I, the, because of the pandemic, we can't travel. So more work is being done via Zoom as we are doing now. You're in Chile, I'm here in the US. And I, I couldn't come to Chile right now and you couldn't come to the US right now. But I find the, the silver lining in the pandemic is that uh, all of us are able to contribute more through the technology virtually and work as teams and work as colleagues together. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, how do you apply to uh, and choose your most relevant areas? Uh, could you uh, please elaborate in those uh, chosen areas and please spend some time talking to the audience about the weakness and the strong points in pursuing these activities? Because you see, whatever you do, there are some weak points and some very strong points. How can you overcome the weakest point? which we are facing now at the moment. The weakest points is um, lack of resources. Uh, globally, there is much wealth in the world, but it is not distributed uh, equitably. And so the, the, the challenge is to get those who are in the haves, and there are few of a few of them, <laughs> there are few of them who have, when you look at the percentage of wealth, uh, and I, I am not quoting the numbers now, but the top 10, probably the top 10 uh, uh, men or women in the, in the world probably own 80 or 90% of the wealth, uh, or 50% of the wealth. I, I, I don't want to mess up the numbers, but my point is all the rest of us are surviving, living, thriving on that that's left from those 10 wealthiest individuals in the world. So, so the weakness is how do, you, how do you get compassion, empathy? How do you get the realization to those people that the way we are now is not sustainable? You saw some recent social unrest. A lot of that unrest came out of understanding that the plight of the people have not changed in decades, even though there have been promises of change. Transformation has not ha happened in, in education. Transformation has not happened in uh, distribution of wealth and income. Transformation has just not happened. And so you have social unrest. The prediction is that as long as people don't know how they're going to be able to take care of themselves, and the majority of the people uh, are, are growing fastest, not in the developed countries, but in the developing countries. Fastest growth population is in Africa, India, uh, and uh, uh, China. And so uh, the challenge is, how are you going to, how are you going to have a supply of jobs for the supply of labor that's available for jobs. We right now just don't have enough. You can look in every sector, even the educated, they don't have jobs. So, 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 so how are we going to fix this? So that's, that's the challenge. The bright side to that, and uh, you asked me for both sides, is I believe that technology itself is gonna help give us the answer. I believe technology is gonna able those enable those who are not able to get into entrepreneurship now because of the capital, the high capital barrier uh, to, to change that. You will need uh, less capital because of the unscaled economy. You will need less uh, resources to do a virtual launch of a business. You are seeing some of that now. So the, the challenge is how to make them more successful. The, 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 
the statistics showed that um, within the first three to five years, most new startups fail. So how do you get them to start, fail, start, fail until they are successful enough to really make a contribution? Uh, and once they start making a contribution, I really believe that it's from that pool, not necessarily the upper pool, but from that pool that we will see transformation for the masses. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I have another question. Well, I have a list of questions actually. What kind of action uh, do you think that young people and professional, new professional, should take to succeed in their life? Because you see, we came to this world to be happy, not to suffer. Yeah. Yeah. So what kind of things uh, they should do? Okay, so so first of all, Professor, happiness comes from the inside. If you if you continue to look at the news or you continue to listen to everything that comes at you, happiness will elude you. So first of all, happiness comes from the inside. Uh, our Global Academy has failed to prepare the youth workforce for the world as it will become. I do believe this will change. The pressure will come from industry demanding transformation to develop new talent at an increased rate uh, who are better prepared for the ambiguity. We didn't know that the pandemic was coming. We didn't know that the economic crisis was coming. We didn't know that uh, the, the, the social unrest was coming. So all of that is ambiguity. How do you create a, a, a young student, a young person who's going to market to be able to face such ambiguity? How to, how to be more creative and innovative and to think critically uh, we, we must become partners with industry. We must engage in research that helps innovate change in the academy as we transform performance and productivity. Uh, there, uh, that will be the engine of growth. And for the young people, credentials for the sake of credentials will not be relevant in the future. The young must learn how to learn. The world is changing so fast, rote memory is not going to serve you well. As the paces of change and innovation and technology will be too rapid for rote memorization and legacy learning tactics. So my, my, my advice to the young people is to embrace learning. Not so much, uh, uh, it's not so much what you know today because that will change. What is important is that you learn how to learn um, I, I'll, I'll just tell you a short story from my time in uh, IBM. I was in the application, and this is long ago, I'm sure it's much faster now. I was in the applications development divisions, uh, application systems development divisions. And what I had learned there at first in the beginning was applications would change every 24 months, then it was every 18 months, then every 12 months, six months and then finally three months and i don't know how fast they change now but what that told me was that if my learning didn't change as fast or if i wasn't able to keep up i could abs uh, obsolete in that kind of environment and so what i say is it's not so much the specific coding language is that you learn how to learn a coding language that's important and that's a specific example not necessarily just defined to computer systems Yes, thank you very much. Uh, the next uh, question is, uh, what do you think is uh, the most likely job situation for young people? Because you see, uh, due to this uh, crisis we are having, uh, this uh, pandemic situation plus the crisis of uh, business and so on, many people are, are losing their jobs and, and that kind of things. In other words, many people are suffering the consequences of uh, what's going on at the moment. And therefore, industry is uh, most likely to ask uh, professional, the new generation of people to learn to, to know more and to be more efficient and to be prepared, you see, uh, to innovate and to do a technology transfer and that kind of things. Because they need uh, the, this industry, the, they will need, you see, uh, to stand up together quicker than ever. So they will need a new professional. What do you think about that? How can we play a role on that? Because you see, we cannot carry on teaching students the same thing that we used to, we, we used to do in the past. 
And uh, we will have to change. This is not possible to carry on with the same thing. No, no, no. I, I, I absolutely agree with you. The new higher education and the post-pandemic higher education will be shaped not internally by the academy, but by its stakeholders, industry, and the students. The students themselves want to learn more and differently from what the academy is offering. Learning, I believe, will become more agile. You know, sometimes if you have a new curriculum, uh, 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 my friend, you know how long it takes here. It could, t it could take up to two years to get a new curriculum through. By the time you've got the curriculum out there, the, the industry and the students have gone on. So we're going to have to become more agile. Faculty, as well as their students, will learn how to learn and engage in different instructional modalities as we see is happening directly as a response to the pandemic. Everybody now is on some kind of virtual learning because we physically can't co come to the bu buildings. That was forced externally, not by the uh, education system itself. Education will become a, a more global as labor becomes more global, I believe. You know, you can have someone working in Chile who is actually working with someone in the U.S. because of the technology. Education, um, however, everyone may not have the need to access college credentials. So let's, let's be very honest about this. The cost of college is almost prohibitive in many areas. The debt that many students take, their parents and themselves do not see the return on investment. So I do see a shakeout, especially of some of the institutions that haven't performed well. Uh, some of them may be absorbed by others or may go uh, away altogether. But this is what I think will happen. Credentialing may become more modular as we see a trend in credential uh, certifications stacked with or without degrees, and they may be accessible in online self-paced learning or even without faculty facilitation. We had a situation where a young man in the US, he had already had his, de his degree. He literally studied online the MIT computer science curriculum, passed all the exams. He did that without a faculty member and he just didn't need the degree. He wanted the learning. So we're gonna be forced to work more as thought leaders and facilitators, not as Socrates delivering the message on the throne. Well, yes, uh, I do agree with that. But you see, a next question, which is related to the, the other one, uh, is uh, what is your view about the future of higher education system? Uh, what is going to be the role of the technical institutions? And what kind of professional will be needed to face the many challenges in the different area of knowledge? Because you see, uh, nowadays, there are some areas which are become very, very important, such as uh, biology, advanced biology, nanotechnology, uh, new devices, uh, highly sophisticated measurement, drug production, and so on. In other words, the world is changing, has changed, and is going to change drastically. And so uh, do you think that the university will have to make a change, a drastic change, uh, or some university will continue doing what they have been doing without failing? My fear is that uh, if they carry on in the same way, they are going to fail completely. And uh, we need to create more job, but that's not easy because you see, um, uh, we need the money. We, we need to innovate to do uh, something else. We cannot live, for instance, in Chile uh, based upon copper all the time. We need to do something. And so far, we have a lot of people talking a lot. But what they do, what they actually do is uh, not something that we can really appreciate. And uh, this is very bad. What do you think the situation is going to be? Uh, I ask you this because I know that you have a, a huge experience and you know people from different continents, from different countries, and therefore you can compare. You go to Africa, for instance, you go to Nairobi, Kenya, and you meet uh, Kiyaki and all the other people, and you know people in San Jose, Costa Rica, you know, and you know so many other countries, you know Poland, a country which I love as well, 
you know, the UK, where you have been um, at least twice or three times, as far as I can record. And how, how do you actually see the world in the very near future without being someone who can see the future because no one can see that? But how can you imagine the world is going to work in the very, very near future? I am cautiously optimistic. Uh, and it's not because of the academy, but it's because of the young people. I, I believe that the young people will find a way where uh, previous generations has failed. Why? Because their very, their very lives depend on it. Uh, you, you, where some of the, 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 the young people are not settling for business as usual. That's the difference between the social unrest we are seeing now and the social unrest we have seen in the past. In the past, it was a selective few, mostly those who were uh, uh, in poverty and disengaged. The new social unrest that's going across the globe is from a wide, the um, a, a, a differentiated group of folks that said, this is not right, this is not fair, this is not sustainable, and it truly is not sustainable. Uh, I, I think the change will be coming from industry that's saying that we need to do things differently, from the students saying we need to do things differently, and from them coming together and squeezing the academy. Now, what's going to happen to the academy? Everyone in the academy, I don't believe, will survive. There will be a shakeout. Number one, there's a uh, in the developed countries, there's declining uh, population and so of college age folks. But in the developing country, how will all of those uh, 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 students be educated? The, the, the book, The Unscaled by Hema Tejos, what he, in his forecast, he believes that, you know, the price point of education will come down, meaning a lot of the institutions who are in the middle, the Ivies will always have their place for whatever reasons. Um, and, 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 uh, but, but, but many of the institutions in the middle will shake out because they won't or are not able to change. To be able to change, you have to change your curriculum and change your faculty or both or some combinations of both. And you will have some who are not willing or able to do that. And so they will not survive with the competition of those who are able to change because of the forces of change. And the reason they won't survive is the careers will be available to those who have met the needs of both the student and the industry. And if there, if your institution, if the academic institution is not placing its students, if the students are not able to go to graduate school or the students are not able to go to work, then the students the larger body of students will migrate. And now, because I'm, almost everyone is forced to go online, you will have to have a competitive advantage in your online offering. What is the difference between the school uh, in uh, Chile and the school in Costa Rica? And why should I stay in your school in Chile when I can go online to a, coast, a Costa Rica school? So as these things accelerate because we were forced to this, um, some schools are, are going to start to fail, but those who survive will be producing a talent that is well equipped to go into the economy to make the change. And I believe that's where the contribution is going to uh, come from. Now, will we have enough jobs for all the young people that want jobs? I don't have the answer to that story. We certainly do not now. Of the highest unemployment rate in most of the developing countries is youth unemployment, uh, even if you factor in education. But I believe it's going to be better because the youth and industry are going to make it better. And we, the old academy, is going to have to adapt. And if we can't adapt, I believe that will be the demise of many in the academy, many institutions in the academy. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, what I would like to ask you next is, uh, will you tell us about your life? And uh, well, you have uh, mentioned some of the facts where you study and so on. But uh, you, as a normal human being, this is not a, a standard interview, actually. This is a friend-to-friend -friend interview, which is something different. I know you very well, and you know me. I think you know me a lot better than I know you. <laughs> 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 uh, 
So uh, you see, uh, there is a point which is uh, sometimes missing from the interviews and webinar and that kind of things. They give you some time and they don't allow you to think uh, in peace and elaborate your concept and that kind of ideas. But you see, you have your family, you have a Grace, which is a beautiful girl, and Abigail, you have your sister, and you have your people in Miami as well, you live near New York and so on. And how do you combine all your activity with your uh, trips abroad and so on to give a lecture and, and uh, webinars and that kind of things? I have followed some of your webinars as much as I, I can on, online. And you are always uh, very, very, very busy indeed. The point is how do you manage to give a good, to be health? to have a good life and at the same time to work so hard as you do. I'm happy that, well, I know that Mega Eva College must be very happy with you, but apart from that, what do you think? Well, how do you think, well, you, you have already said, I mean, in a very loud and clear way that happiness is from inside, that's very true. But uh, what happened with the new generation? Do you think that those people uh, will have a life like the one we have at the moment, or they will have, or everything is going to change drastically. And uh, there are so many things that uh, should be addressed. Uh, this is mainly for young people. If, uh, uh, this is going to be, you know, uploaded in Facebook, LinkedIn, and in all the website we have. And uh, for the young people and young professionals to look at and to see the experience of senior people as well as from, from young professionals. So what do you think about the whole situation in the very near future uh, after this uh, pandemic? But uh, we cannot forget that uh, the economy, uh, we are going now before the pandemic as well. Uh, the state where are spending more money than the money they, they produce everywhere. So uh, how can we actually uh, act in the very near future unless we want a collapse, which is not something that uh, sensible people want. We want to, to grow and, and justice, which is the most important thing. Everybody is the same, equal. Therefore, everybody should deserve just the same. What do you think about the whole issue from the social point of view? That's a big question. Um, I, I don't believe that one size fits all. We all have very different talents. There are some things that you can do as a physicist that I could never do. I'm an economist. <laughs> 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 and, and, and so, but, but what, what I really do believe that each of us have our own destiny, our own path and our own best work. My best work is different from someone else's best work. And, 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 and you ask me how I do it. I, I really am not trying to do Roberto's best work because Roberto is, can do his best work. I look every day and I say, Joanne, have you given all you have? Because you know, one day we all will cease to give. Um, and, 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 and if my answer to that question is, I have done the best that I could do. I've had some, within the last couple of weeks, I had some serious challenges. Uh, and some, some, some challenges that I really was trying to work through with my best thought and my best thinking. And at the end of the day, uh, the problem wasn't necessarily solved. But what brought me to my happiness was I did everything I could do. I did the best that I could do. And so um, when you see me, like this week alone, I have maybe three engagements and they are all virtual because I'm not traveling as much. I, I hope to start traveling again by the end of the year or maybe by next year. Who knows when, if one can get in a plane again. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I go and it, it, because there's something inside me that says that my purpose, my my reason for being 
is to do the work that I have prepared and am continue to prepare to do. And uh, if part of that is my family. Part of that is working with my daughter and my granddaughter who bring me great joy. But my life and my life work is not limited to my family. It is expanded, not just to Mega Evers, which is my, my home community academically, but the broader academic community. When they asked me to go to Nairobi the first time, it was for women entrepreneurship because women all over the world are seeking pathways to earn incomes and they're not allowed to do it in um, some of the formal office settings because those jobs go to men first. Pick a country, you know? Uh, and so the women were starting to look in, at least in Africa, for uh, to entrepreneurship. And that has been the story in many of the places that I've been. In. Entrepreneurship has been looked at as a way out for the underserved, the women, the youth, you name it. Even in Nairobi when we went, it wasn't just the women. There was youth uh, entrepreneurship because there's a challenge, a big challenge in, 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 in Kenya for youth unemployment, and they don't know what to do. Uh, the same thing is in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. Uh, in Tanzania, uh, when I was there last year, the, the government enacted a program where every college person would be able to take a course in entrepreneurship. Why? There are just not enough jobs. And that's the story, a reoccurring story in India, in Bangladesh, in, uh, in Pakistan. I was in Pakistan. And, 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 and you know the history of women in education in Pakistan. So I feel like, uh, I, I hate to use this as a, a term, but I feel like I'm called to the work. I've been prepared for the work. And I, I, I have to do the work to the best of my ability. Am I gonna solve all the world problems? I don't think so. But can I make a difference in one young person's life, in one woman's life, in one faculty member's life, in one institution, in another institution, in another country? Yes, I can. And so that's what I choose to try and do. And absolutely. Well, that's absolutely wonderful. Uh, well, I have to say to, uh, to the people who are going to listen to this uh, tape that uh, uh, there is a question, uh, where does Denise come from? Because you, your name is uh, Joanne Denise. <laughs> well, can you say something or you better yeah, well, say well, well, no, I, I, I'm processing because my, uh, 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 my mother is no longer living and she gave me the name of Denise because that was one of her friends or someone she knew. Um, I, Joanne comes from my, my father's side. His father's name uh, was Joe and they wanted a son. They got a daughter, so my name was Joanne. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's absolutely wonderful. Well, uh, uh, what I had to do is uh, I had to acknowledge you for all you are doing for us and uh, supporting us in, in every single activity. Uh, we will get involved because you see the main idea here is from our point of view is to contribute and collaborate to people. You see, independently of uh, their country and uh, that kind of things, which uh, to me are rather irrelevant. Uh, to me, the most important thing are people. And this is what we, are, we should uh, carry on fighting for and making their life a lot better in the way we can do it. So this kind of interview, and then we are going to have you, you go once, uh, in uh, a webinar. But we'll have uh, more time to today think easily. And uh, well, I don't know what do you think about these kind of interviews uh, where you can express uh, what you think without being in a hurry and that kind of thing. Do you think it's uh, something which it should be uh, it should be on in in the next uh, interviews and that kind of thing? So, what is your point of view? Yeah, I have a I think the format is, is good. Oftentimes when you're looking at a normal webinar, it's focused on a specific topic, it's focused on learning a specific uh, issue, um, sometimes it's political, sometimes it's academic. I think it's good to have a format where, you know, you just get to know people in another place and another time and what they're doing and what they're thinking. Um, 
and, 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 and so when you hear the next webinar, you understand where it comes from. You understand more about the person and what the person is thinking and how they feel. Feel Feeling is important. Maya Angelou, the, the great writer, uh, the uh, uh, African-American writer said, people may forget what you said, but they will never forget how you make them feel. And so uh, oftentimes when I'm reading a book, I might forget what the book was about, but I remember a good book because I remember how it makes me feel. So I, I think this is good because it shares personality. It shares depth of the person and uh, uh, the, the, the soul as opposed to a specific goal of sharing information. Well, uh, uh, let me say that um, um, I would like to thank you very much indeed. And also I would like uh, you uh, to pass on to your family and uh, the other people all my love and affection. And uh, we are going to be in touch. And thank you, thank you very much indeed for everybody. I'm just speaking on behalf of many people from different countries because this is going to be uh, seen by different people everywhere. And therefore, uh, I do thank you. I know that I'm taking some time from you, but uh, I know that you are only, always willing to help people. And therefore, I will continue <laughs> to bother you. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much indeed. And uh, a great kiss. And, uh, Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye bye. Thank, bye, bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> All right. Bye bye.